Okay, let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you so much for giving us this time together. What a wonderful opportunity we have to, to consider your word. Um, we, got, we got some requests, Anna and, and Barry and Tyler and, and Buss and Ron, you know, and, and also there's a lot of unspoken things uh, that we're all carrying around. But you know, Lord, you, you have said, or, or your apostle Paul said, that you, you know what we need. Uh, we can communicate with you through the Spirit with groans too deep for words. So you know what we need. Uh, address, intervene in those needs. And also give us the comfort and the peace to recognize that your will is going to be done. And your ultimate will is compassion and mercy and grace. So regardless of what's happening around us, keep us mindful that you are in charge and your, our ultimate future is going to be glorious. So help us to see that in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. 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 All right. We're lo we've been looking at, uh, you've been looking at uh, uh, episodes mm -hmm. in, the, in The Chosen. And one of the things that you said you wanted to do was to talk about some of the characters you've run across. And we've already done two of them. Um, we, we did Nicodemus, and in a nutshell, what did we say about, what was your conclusion as we looked at passages with Nicodemus? He was almost a believer. He was almost, as you, pre as you see the presentation in, in John, which is kind of cool, because there's only three places in John where he talks about Nicodemus, but there's a development, you know, if you took all the other stuff out about John and just had those three passages, you see this. Develop one at the beginning, one in the middle, one at the end. This development in Nicodemus, where he starts as a person who comes in from what? The dark. The dark, which is a big deal in John. Dark and light is a big deal as he writes his gospel. You know, he comes in from the dark, yep. right? And as he goes in, as he the story progresses, he becomes more into the light. Into the light. Into the light. In fact, at the last one he's mentioned at the end, remember, even John tells us, and again, uh, and I've said this a couple of times, and I'll probably say it every time, you know, we want to remember that these writers, these evangelists are writing stories, you know, so they, they want us to come away thinking certain ways, believing certain things. These are not reporters that are just, impar you know, impartially writing down facts, you know, to remember. They, they are shaping stories. And so even at the end, John, the writer, says to us, when he talks about Nicodemus bringing the, the stuff to embalm Jesus right after his death, John will say, Nicodemus, who, who visited Jesus at night. You know, as the description of Nicodemus, almost like John is saying, now remember this Nicodemus way in chapter, chapter 3? Uh huh. The one that's bringing the spices was in the dark in chapter three. He ain't in the dark anymore. Uh, and and it's you know this is what the writer I think what the writer is trying to do for for us the reader. So all right, so we talked about Nicodemus last week. We talked about who Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. And we know certain things about Mary Magdalene. What were some of the conclusions that you reached as we looked at those passages? As opposed to Nicodemus, this in one of the Gospels, Mary Magdalene is in. All of the Gospels. You know, so we see her in all of the Gospels. Uh, and she's probably, outside of the Apostles, a name that comes up a lot, but not a lot of information about Mary Magdalene. You know, in, in the story, other than her name appears and she's with... Yeah, what, with whom was Mary associated? Most of the time when Mary shows up in the story, she's not alone. She's with other women. She shows up with other women, you know, and where does she show up with other women? At a distance. Okay, good. When we talked about the crucifixion, you know, the crucifixion, she's at a distance, which is a big deal. Well, she's at a distance in, in Mark and Matthew and Luke. But in John, she's not at a, in a distance. She is where? Right at the cross, standing beside Mary, the mother of Jesus. So, you know, again, that's why we want to recognize that these writers are shaping a story, you know, and the early church knew we got four Gospels that weren't identical, but they felt all four Gospels needed to be in there, so they included it. They could have included just one, 
and said, that's the right one. But they included all four that have information that's different because each of them gives us a different impression of who Jesus is. And so when you know, Mary is at the cross, but then for Mark's pur- John's purposes, Jesus doesn't die alone. He's surrounded by his followers. But in Matthew and Luke and Matthew and Mark, Jesus is alone at the cross. So the only persons who could see it that would be believers are people who would be watching from a distance. From a distance. Okay, because Jesus is alone at the cross. That's a big point in, in the Gospel of Mark. I wonder if they were really allowed to get very close. Well, you know. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? You know, certainly as we, we read, and particularly Matthew and Mark, and, and, and as we approach Easter, we may talk about it sometime. Uh, as we, we look at Matthew and, and Mark, Jesus being alone on the cross is really a big deal. You know, and that's why in Matthew and Mark, you remember the last words Jesus says at the cross in Matthew and Mark. His last words from the cross in Matthew and Mark. I commend myself. Oh. Good, good, good. Yeah. That's in the Gospel of Luke. To you, I com- Father, to you I commend my spirit. Wow. How does Jesus die on the cross in Luke? To you, his last words, to you I commend my spirit. He dies feeling what? Alone. Well, I mean, when, if he says that, to you I commend my spirit. Then he's going. Then, yeah. then it's, it's, oh, it's accomplishment. It's faith. To you, Father, I commend my spirit. You know, we get this great statement of faith at the end of his last words in Luke. Jesus, that's great. In John, his last words are, it is finished. His mission on yeah. earth is done. You know, consistent with what John writes. Not his last words. Aren't that in in the Gospel of Matthew and Mark. His last words are, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because everyone else that has. And that's why he's got, he can't be surrounded by his disciples at the cross. Because if he were, he couldn't say, Why have even you forsaken me? You know, it does, it's, doesn't make sense. I never thought of that. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Because both of those evangelists want us to understand, uh, particularly Mark, that Jesus is Son of God, man, when he's hanging on that cross, when he is absolutely alone. That's why the centurion in Mark, when he sees how Jesus dies, says, truly he was the Son of God. When he saw how he died, that, and Mark even says that, when he saw how he died, he said, truly, he's the son of God. The centurion saw him die absolutely alone, absolutely abandoned by everybody, including God, and die. And the centurion said, that's what it means to be son of God, is to experience the depth of human pain. Boom. The evangelist John has a different view of what happens on the cross. Not right, not wrong, just different. And we need to include that sort of mentally. We don't want to blend it, but we include that mentally as we think about the significance of the cross. Because it's not just his loneliness, it's also his accomplishment. You know. And Luke, he dies with faith. Jesus dies with faith. Well, we can too. So each of them are showing different dimensions. Okay, so anyway, we, so we looked at Mary Magdalene, and she's part of the women, and depends on which of the Gospels we look at. I mean, the women, you know, the odd things at the, at the uh, resurrection is when Mary, the presentation of Mary really varies. Because remember, in the resurrection story we looked at in Mark, what do those women in which Mary is a part, what do they end up doing? Which blows my mind. It, remember in Mark when they go to the tomb and the young man says, I want you to do two things. I want you not to be afraid and I want you to tell the disciples. That's the two things. Write it down. If you need to write it down, write it down, put it in your organizer. And what does Mark say? Tell no one. No. What do the women do? <laughs> they ran from the tomb. Because they were afraid and they told no one. They told no one. Verse 8. Chapter 16, oh, verse 8. Okay. They thinking. told no one. Now, that's in Mark. The other Gospels, you know, what does Mary do? Jesus says in Matthew, the, the angel on, on top of the stone says, go and tell the disciples. And what does Mary, what do the women do? They go and tell the disciples. And in fact, as they're going to tell the disciples, who do they meet? 
Jesus. Jesus. And makes a lot of sense because Jesus says, just a few verses later, go and make disciples of all nations. And who's going to be with you? I'm going to be with you. The law I'm with you to the end of the age. Jesus is Emmanuel. That's what Matthew says. You know, so whole different view. You know, one they don't tell anybody, the other one they tell every tell the disciples. And then John is that interesting one where Mary sees the empty tomb, goes to tell the disciple Peter and, and the beloved disciple run and see the tomb. Then Mary is back in the garden and runs into Jesus. And that's why this one is so kind of significant in and of itself. Remember Jesus, Mary's in the garden and she sees a guy and she doesn't. Recognize she doesn't him. recognize him. And, but John tells us, who is he? Jesus. Jesus. John, that's why we rely on the writer. The writer tells us who he is. That's not part of the narrative. The writer says, this is Jesus. She encounters Jesus in the garden, but doesn't, he, she doesn't recognize him, right? And she, even when she's looking at his face, she doesn't recognize him, right? And, and she says, but theologically, now it makes a little bit of sense. She doesn't recognize him in the garden. And she says, if you've taken his body, please tell us where you've laid him. And what does Jesus say? And this causes chills to go through me. What does Je Jesus says one word to her? Mary, Mary, he Mary. says, Mary. And as soon as he says Mary, her response is Mary. Rabboni. Rabboni. She recognizes. Him. And you say, well, oh, well, she, he must, his face must have been covered. You're looking logically in it. You don't want to do that. You know, what message is John saying? You know? Well, you look in John, geez Louise, the good shepherd. What's one of the characteristics of the good shepherd? He knows his sheep by name. And not only does he know them by name, they know his voice. And so when he calls them by name, what do the sheep do? They come. They recognize him and come. As soon as he said, Mary, she knew his name. And bang, she's there. Jeez Louise, man. That's powerful. Now, if that had happened in Matthew, you'd say, well, I don't know if that's the case. But Jesus happens in John. Happens in John here. Happens in John here. I think they're related. Or you got to kind of make the assumption that they're related. You know, there's a connection. So, you know, okay. What we're going to do today is we're going to look at Peter. And, and you're going to do a lot more than I than I've done. And I, I talk a lot because I like to hear myself talk. <laughs> um, <you know. laughs> and, and when I talk, I like one person, at least one person to be interested. You know, so <laughs> we're going we're gonna to look at myself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we're going to look at Peter. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff on Peter. Jeez <clears throat> Louise. And that's what we're going to break it into two parts, pre-resurrection and post-resurrection. Um, and and because the pre-resurrection Peter is a lot different than the post-resurrection uh, Peter, and we'll see that. Um, now, um, as we we look at Peter, there's there's a couple of things that I want you just to file away even before we look at it. As he's in all the Gospels, and, and you know not everybody is in all the Gospels, uh, but he's in all four four Gospels, and he's also in Acts, and Paul mentions him and that, uh, but. Uh, he, there are characteristics of Peter that we see that are similar in all four of the Gospels. And uh, one of the characteristics, well, let me ask you, what, at, even before that, you saw the presentation of the show. Most of you have watched the mm -hmm. How is he presented, just so that we have a sort of a baseline, how is he presented, or how has he been presented in this? And I understand this is a, a director and a writer and a producer shaping the story, the same thing the evangelists are doing. They're kind of shaping this story, you know, so that we're engaged in it. What, how has Peter been presented in this story? Mostly as the fisherman and the fact that he can be, he makes a lot of mistakes in the okay. beginning. <laughs> okay, yeah. so he's a fisherman, but makes mistakes. Yes. <laughs> why, why in the presentation does he make mistakes? It's a little hot-headed. Okay, hot-headed, good. You know, I could have told you that without even saying it. And I haven't seen it, yeah. but I could have told you, because that's usually how Peter is presented. Mm -hmm. Kind of a hot, burly guy. He's not burly. No. Okay, he's not burly, okay. Because often he's a burly guy. You know, he's a worker. David, you know, I had him portrayed as a muscular guy, yeah. too. Yeah, Mus yeah. Okay, okay, so he is. That's what I meant by burly. Yeah, you know, kind of, kind of stocky. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
and, and kind of gruff. Yeah. A yeah. little bit yeah. gruff. Yeah. Yeah. Makes a lot of mistakes. Yeah. A little yeah. feisty. Feisty. Yes, but he's strong. Mind. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Has his own mind. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah, and and impulsive, right? I bet he's impulsive. He's impulsive. Yeah, yes. yeah. He gets yes. he gets emotional and you know fired up quickly, you know, and acts without thinking. Yeah. Am I right? Yes. Oh, yes. I didn't see it, and I know it because that's usually how Peter's presented. I mean, that's kind of and that's fine because that's kind of reflected somewhat in in scripture. We certainly get illusions of that in scripture. What we're trying to do is we're trying to see what Scripture says. Yeah. You know, what, how Peter is presented, but even more important than that, how Peter works in each of the Gospels. What role does he play? Well, there's certain roles he plays, and, and it, you may not have seen it yet. It may come, but it may not. But one of the roles he tends to play in all four of the Gospels is Peter is often the spokesman. You know, and, and as a writer, you know, and I'm not talking about history, because nobody, none of us were there, you know. All we have are these writers that are compiling the tradition at the earliest 40 years after Jesus is gone. So, you know, that's a long, that's two generations. You know, after Jesus is gone, now they're putting together Gospels. And, you know, Matthew and Luke are probably later than that. That's why I had another 30 years. You know, so it's, these were written way after Jesus. So they're basing it on traditions, and you don't have written, a lot of stuff written, so it's a lot of it all. And, and so they're, they're shaping, that's why the characters can be different in each of the Gospels, because they're, they're shaping it at different times to different audiences. And all of them are writing to churches. You know, none of these are Gideons leaving the Gospel of Mark in a hotel room for somebody to read. You know, they're going to churches, you know, of people who already know the story and already believe the story. I'm giving you some more information, you know, on which you can base your faith, a sort of a foundation to a faith that's already there. And that's also important for us to remember. These, are not, these were not used as conversion tools in the early church. These were used to help Christians understand the one they talked about better. You know, that's what, it, that's what these gospels were intended to do, be, particularly in terms of faith. So Peter tends to be the spokesman of the group. So, you know, in, especially in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, if somebody's got a question, they go to Peter. You know, if somebody, if Peter makes a statement, it may be a statement that represents the other 11, or at least the other 10. Judas is a sort of a wild card. But, you know, he, he is the spokesman for the group, and that's kind of the function he, he plays. So sometimes when he makes a statement, when you read the Gospels and Peter says something or does something, you, you, maybe in the back of your mind, you know, you're not, don't think in terms of the other 10 going on. That was stupid. Uh, but, you know, the other ones are nodding the head. So, you know, Peter's the one that's stepping out. You know, he is the one that, that makes these, the spokesman to the group. Okay. And that's something. Now, there, and often Peter appears with other disciples. And as you just read on your own, uh, which are the other, and, and from the past, because I don't know that you may not have seen it yet, what other disciples, apostles, is Peter often associated with? And I dangled a participle and I apologize to all you English sticklers. With which apostles is Peter usually associated? James, John, and John. James and John. It's the triad. Jeez, what a surprise three. that we've got three. You know, we've talked about that a lot. Three is a big deal in the ancient world. You know, four is not a big deal. You want to know why Andrew isn't part of this little group? You know, because it's not a quartet, it's a trio. Because quartets have to do with earth. Four, trios have to do with up there. So you got a trio, Peter, James, and John. And can you think of stories where Peter, James, and John are sort of hanging out together? Transfiguration. Transfiguration. Jesus takes them up on a mountain. And what happens at the transfiguration? In, in three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, doesn't appear in John. What happens on the transfiguration? Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, and they go where? Uh, where, do they, where do they go? He takes, yep. Yeah. Apple Mountain. Apple Mountain, right. And when you think about, when you say, and I think we talked about this in Sunday school last week, you know, when, when you, you look at the historicity, but you also, maybe more important, you know, what are the, what's, what's the symbolic reason, you know, for mountains? Well, mountains 
in the ancient world were considered places where you did what? Right. Pray. What, yeah, why did you worship and pray on mountains? Close, 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 to, God. close to God. I mean, duh. Why did the Egyptians build pyramids? Closer to God. That was a mountain. You know, why did, why did they build ziggurats in, in Mesopotamia or in, in Aztec America? You know, these pyramids. You know, they weren't worshiping God in a basement. They were worshiping God where? On top of a man-made mountain. You know, because that's where you're closer to God. Read the gospel. Sometimes read the gospel of Matthew and just see how much. Matthew's big on that. Everything takes place on mountains in Matthew. Jesus, Louise, where does Jesus give his major sermon? On the mount. Sermon where? On the mount. On the mount. You know, if you look at the teachings in Luke, the same teaching in Luke. Luke says they're on a plane. You know, it's on, on flat. He doesn't mention mountains. Matthew has everything happening on mountains. In fact, one of the more bizarre things in Matthew is Jesus does great things on mountains. He prays on mountains. He teaches on mountains. He does, you know, things on mountains. And it pierced at the end to his disciples. Where? On a mountain in Galilee. You know, these are where he, that's what happens. Transfiguration. There's a, there's a verse in Matthew. And it's, it's, when you think about it, if you think about it historically, you'd say, well, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It talks about Jesus healing people. And it, Matthew will list the people. He's healing the lame on mountaintops. How did they get there? Yeah, they get these guys lugging lame people up a mountain. You know, you read that and say, why the devil didn't Jesus just go down? Because he could walk around and heal them, you know, at home. That doesn't make any sense. Well, it doesn't if we look at it in terms of fact, what's right, historical, and what's not. Theologically, it makes a lot of sense. Because he does things on mountains because that's where you're closest to God. So if you kind of take the, the location, the geography out, and start thinking about what Matthew may be telling us, you know, then it makes a lot of sense. His healing of people is associated with that connection, you know, to God. Also, Matthew, in Matthew, there's a real, Matthew loves para, running Jesus and Moses, sort of in parallel. So we got a lot of Moses, Jesus, you know, comparison in in Matthew. The only difference is that Jesus is always better. And so he does his great things on mountains. Okay, but so transfiguration, though, it's on a mountain, right? What happens on transfiguration? He drags, he drags these disciples up on top of a mountain. And they get a preview of what's to come. Who appears? Moses. And Elijah. Moses, Elijah. <laughs> Boom, on the mountain. Why Moses? Law. Law. Why Elijah? Prophets, boom, they're on the mountaintop, talking to Jesus. Peter says something really stupid, like, let me build you some tents, and, you know, so you can hang around, and, you know, because he doesn't know what he's talking about, which is another characteristic of Peter before the resurrection. He is ignorant. Uh, he says some stupid stuff uh, in the gospel. Like so, yeah, I mean, he is. I mean, and you, the reader reads it, and, and we, I think the evangelists want us to read that and say, this guy is clueless. You know, he's following Jesus right. He don't know what's going on. Uh, you know, he and But it gives me hope. Well <laughs> and, and, and I think yeah, yeah. that's I think you see that means the evangelist has done what they wanted to do. Because it, I think particularly Mark, I think that's exactly what he wants us to do. Look, if a guy as stupid as Peter and James, and remember James and, and John were arguing about who was going to sit on the right side and the left side. You know, Jesus Louise, if they can be as clueless and they are apostles, there's hope for us. Right. You know, if they can be stupid, you know, like posts, right. you know, they're, <laughs> they just don't know what's going on. You know, we got some hope, right? Yeah. You know, in fact, we might say we're, we're a little more advanced than these guys. So maybe one of the things we might want to stop saying is, gosh, how lucky those apostles were to hear Jesus talking. You know, if I had been there, boy, well, the people who heard him talk, they weren't the ones that followed him later. You know, they weren't the ones. They were the ones that we shot for his crucifixion. You know, so I think all the evangelists are saying, you know, in one way or another, you after Jesus, you're the lucky ones. You know, because you got the Holy Spirit and they didn't. And so you know, and they didn't know. They didn't have a clue. So you were lucky. Jeez, that's good. That means the people who are reading his gospels feel good about themselves. You know, excited about doing God's work. Instead of saying, oh gosh, look how horrible things are now. 
<laughs> oh, things are terrible. What are we going to do? Yeah, we're not doing that because we, we, have, we have hope. We got because we got the spirit. They didn't. Okay. So transfiguration. We got Peter and James and John. Can you think of another story? We got Peter, James, and John in the garden when we have to pray. <laughs> and and they come out looking really good in the garden, don't oh, they? No, they oh, don't. they don't. <laughs> Peter, James, and John. They go out. And they're going to pray. You know, they Gethsemane. Have. That's they have. Meal is over. Jesus again says, I want you to do one thing for me, guys. Yeah. One thing. Watch out. <laughs> Stay away. Watch. You know, and I, I don't even, I don't even want, you don't even have to pray for, with me. You know, you don't even have to go to this prayer meeting. You know, I'll, I'm going to pray by myself. All you have to do is stay away. That's what I have. Have a conversation. You know, enjoy yourself. You know, stay away. Goes to pray. Comes back. <sighs> then wakes him up. Now, guys, strike one. <laughs> strike one. You know, I'll give you another chance. I'm going to go and pray some more. Now, clearly, since you fell asleep the first, you won't fall asleep a second time, right? Yep. You know, because you got that power nap in. Yeah. So you should be fine. And he goes off and prays, and what do they do? Because they sleep again. Second time. Well, clearly, you've now slept for what? Like an hour and a half. You should be fine. I'm going to go off and pray again. Just stay awake. Just stay awake. Goes off at prayers, he goes, goes to sleep again. So, and Peter's one of that group, so they don't come out looking as good. One of the things that's interesting, and again, file away, because it's again how the evangelists are working it. Luke doesn't, doesn't name the, the people Jesus takes. Luke doesn't name them. So he doesn't have Peter, James, and John falling asleep. And one of the, and that's a, you say, oh, that's a little thing. Oh. Well, one of the things we're going to see in Acts is Peter's going to be an important person in the book of Acts. He's going to be a big, big guy. And so is, so is James, well, James to a lesser extent. But John, they're going to be really important in Acts. I don't think Luke wants us to have a negative view of Peter. And so Luke kind of protects Peter a little bit. You know, kind of. He still denies him. We'll talk about that in a minute. But, you know, he kind of protects him. Somebody else Luke protects and please file this away when you look at the story. He really protects the Romans. Luke really protects the I wonder Romans. Why. Well, think about it logically. Now think about or historically. And I'm not talking about the in the history of the gospel itself, but the time frame in which it was given. If Luke is written somewhere around the year 90, Mark is probably written somewhere around the year 70 probably before the destruction of the temple in 71, because Mark doesn't seem to know that the temple was destroyed. But it was during the revolution against the Romans. So the other evangelists write about the destruction of the temple. So evidently they knew. So they were writing afterwards. But Mark doesn't seem to know the details. So Luke is probably written mm, 90, about the same time as, as Matthew. What, how has the world changed for Christians, even from the year 60 to the year 90? Uh, it's, they're persecuting, okay. and if he attacks the Romans in his writing, then it will be squashed. Give yourself, give yourself a star. <laughs> just write, just write, write down, write down I O U Jewel. I'll give you one of mine if I get it. Um, the, uh, uh, that's exactly right. Now think about it logically. If 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 Luke really and all of the evangelists kind of protect the Romans a little bit, because who is responsible for the death of Jesus? Well, the Romans historically were, but who do the evangelists want us to be angry at? The Jews. Yeah, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, it's the Jewish leaders. In the Gospel of John, it is the Jews. Because that's, that's the enemy in John, the Jews. You know, that's the Jewish leaders. That, those are the ones we should, we should be angry with. The problem is Jesus was not... And I, when you say Jesus was not stoned, that has a whole different meaning now. You know? <laughs> you know, Jesus was a, you know, Jesus was not executed by stoning, and stoning was a pretty bad way to go. We think of it as throwing stones, but it isn't. Stoning wasn't throwing stones. Stone was stone when you stone because the Jews didn't like blood, because blood is life, and they didn't like to be touching blood and stuff. And throwing stones at somebody is pretty bloody. And so what stoning was was they put a great big stone on you. And, and yeah, you couldn't breathe. You, you smothered. 
So it wasn't a fast way to go. It was a pretty unpleasant way to go. And that, and, but there wasn't blood. You know, you just... Expired. Yeah. Ex very good. <laughs> very good. Uh, the, but that's, that's exactly what happened. Now, you know, it says in all the Gospels, the Jews say, we have no way to kill a person. That, that's historically just not true. The Jews were killing people right and left, executing yeah. people right and left. The Jews had no qualms, and the Romans loved it. The, you know, Romans didn't want to be the guys that were the only guys executing people. You know, they wanted the Jews to kill problems. You know, then it, they don't have to pay for it. You know, Romans were interested in money. They did, they want to save money. And so, you know, they didn't want to just nail people on the cross unless they were a problem to Rome. If the Romans perceived a person as a problem to their authority, then they're going to nail them to a cross. Being nailed to a cross is a whole lot worse than having a stone put on you and smother. That was a bad way to go. You know, so the Ro historically, the Romans must have seen, and evidently Jesus died, clearly must have died on the cross, because it's, it's in all the Gospels and all the letters. You know, that is one of the pieces of the tradition that is consistent. So he was nailed on a Roman cross. Well, if you, if you blame the Romans, so he must have done something that really ticked the Romans off, really ticked them off. Well, well, if the if if the Jew, if if the perception was that he was a political problem, that he was going to lead to revolution, that he was going to cause the Romans to have to put in to pay for troops to put down a revolution. And one thing people one thing people don't do when they're rebelling, they don't pay their taxes. You know, so if if the tax money was going to get cut off and they were going to have to pay soldiers to put down a revolution, that's bad for business. And the Romans were all about business. That's bad for business. So they didn't want to have to deal with that. And so people that they perceived as problems, political problems, not religion, the Romans could care less about religion, unless it crossed over into politics. You know, if it became a political issue, Romans would, would be on that like white on rice. And if the perception is Jesus is about to lead a revolution, they're going to nail him to a cross. They're going to nail him to a cross because he is a problem. And not only is he going to be nailed on a cross, they want everybody who is walking in that crowd thinking, you know, maybe we should kick the Romans out. They want, the Romans want you to see that's what happens when you have those thoughts. When you have those thoughts, we're going to nail you on a cross. And dying on a cross was a bad, we'll talk about that in the future, that's a bad way to die. That's a, I can't think of a worse way to die than a cross. It took days and days to die on a cross. It wasn't fast. But the Romans didn't want the blame. Well, that's, that's, how, we pre that's how it's presented. Yeah. Because the evangelists want Christians to blame the Jews. Don't want them to blame the Romans because if you start blaming the Romans, what's going to happen to your little bitty church in Ephesus? Yeah. Romans are going to shut it down. And at that time, you're not big enough to stand up to the Romans. They're going to shut you down. And so... It's in their interest. You don't want to take the Romans off. Jews say, a lot more Jews than Christians running around. But Jews don't have power. Romans do. You know, if, if the perception is that you're a problem to the Romans, they're going to shut you down. And they had the power to do it. And so the evangelists are very careful. And also Christianity is spreading in a Gentile world, you know, by the, by the end, you know, of the first century. So you don't want to take off Gentiles. You know, more Gentiles are coming in than Jews. You know, so... You, you don't want to take those Gentiles down off. So the, the, the church is changing, but it's really, a, they, they tend to protect, and Luke does it a lot, you know, protecting the Romans. I mean, even in Acts, because, you know, all the stuff with, you know, Herod Agrippa and Bernice and, you know, Felix, and, you know, uh, he's really, really careful that the Romans, are, they're not good guys, but they ain't the bad guys. It's the Jewish leaders that are the bad guys. Do you think that the Jewish leaders used the Romans to do it because they feared a rebellion by the people against the, the leaders of the church, of the Jewish thing? So if they could pawn Jesus off onto the Romans, it protected them from the, this, the disruption that would have been caused. That is a great, that's a great question. Because you're talking about the history, the history, yeah. and and my answer to that is is I, I think absolutely, and one of the things, and, and then I'm, I want to talk about Peter, but I love this, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, it becomes a reality after the year seventy one. In Judaism, 
you have different groups in Judaism. In, in America, we have different groups in America. You know, primarily right now, Democrats and Republicans. You know, that's, and we all know Democrats and Republicans get along really well. We listen to one another, we understand one another, because we want to be united. Unity as a country is far more important than personal interest, right? Uh, it sounds better if you say it in Greek. Uh, the, uh, well, the Jews, had, Jews were in the same, same situation within Judea and, and Christianity. I used to use denominations, but most people don't even know what denominations mean. Even in denominations, we don't know what it means. You know, we don't know the difference between Presbyterians and Methodists, just as Presbyterians are to spell. You know, and you know, we in the South we knew Episcopalians dressed better. Uh, you know, so uh, you know because they had more money. You know, so um, you know, and, and and our Catholic friends could go to church on Saturday and had Sunday off. So you know those things, but we don't know. We those denominational labels don't mean too much now because we don't know what they we don't know their history. But uh, back then in, in Judaism, there were different groups. And do you, we, I, we may have mentioned, do you know the groups within Judaism? Sadducees. Okay, good. Sadducees. Sadducees. Now, Sadducees get a real bad rap when you look at the Gospels. And primarily because Sadducees no longer existed when the Gospels were written. They didn't exist. They were things you read in history books, scrolls. Sadducees come, the word Sadducees come from the, the Greek Hebrew word Zadok, Zadok. And Zadok means righteous. Whoa, whoa. The name of the group was righteous. righteous. Wow. You know, usually now when people think about, read the Gospels and think about Sadducees, you think, oh, and some folks will present it this way. Oh, Sadducees were corrupt. Oh, they were terrible. You know, oh, they were getting bribes and all oh, that stuff. Lord have mercy, the name of the group was righteous. They were considered the righteous ones. You know, so a Sadducee was, in terms of the, on the righteous scale, man, he was like 11. You know, on the, the, on the scale of righteousness, from one to 10, he was at 11. And their focus was on temple worship, the sacrifices, the law, the first five books, the Torah, and they knew them backward and forward. And it, it, it was about the sacrifices. In fact, the Sadducees were so focused on the purity of the sacrifice, you know, killing animals on the, on the altar. And you could only do it in one place. I mean, you, didn't, you couldn't have like a half dozen temples all around. It wasn't a local, it wasn't like McDonald's, you know, the temples, you know, in each little town. You had one temple, and if you did a sacrifice, you had to do it in the temple. And if you had to march 150 miles to go to the, that's what you did. You couldn't do a sacrifice in your backyard, build a little altar there and kill an animal. You know, barbecue, yes. Yeah. Sacrifice, no. <laughs> you had to go all the way to, and that's why the cleansing of the temple is so was such a big deal. And it's not usually what we think it means. Something else is going on, you know, with the cleansing of the temple. But the Sadducees were focused on temple worship, temple worship, temple worship. And they were so focused on the purity of temple worship that it had to be pleasing to God that when Herod built, because Herod, you know, Herod, the, all the Herods, and the old man Herod, Herod the Great, named all his kids Herod. All the boys he named Herod. So like George Foreman, named all his sons George. You know, Herod named all his sons Herod. Because he had a bunch of wives, but he named them all Herod. You know, and it made it hard to keep track of them. You know, like Herod I, Herod II. That's not true. Some of his... But, but uh, and of course, Herod was... He, he went crazy at the end and killed any son he had that was competent. Any son he thought would be a threat, he killed. So the only one sons left were, were dimwits. Yeah, so the Herods left was, were, were not the sharpest Herods in the drawer. Uh, so we had, a, so Herod, but he wasn't a Jew. He was a Jew by religion, but he wasn't a Jew by blood. And the Sadducees, that was a big deal. You had to be purity, you had to be a Jew by blood. And the Herods weren't. They were what were called Edomians, uh, descendants from the Edomites, descendants of Edom, which were kind of cousins of the Jews, but the Jews and Edomites never got along well. So, the, uh, so they, were, they were Edomites. And so the Sadducees believed that the Herod had, should have nothing to do with the temple because the temple needed to be pure. Well, they had a problem because Herod built the temple, you know, the, the third temple. He tore the old one down that was built by Nehemiah and, and built a new one, and it was big, it was big, it was really cool, it was great. Had a roof like we're gonna put on here. No, no, not really. Uh, but it was glorious. It was beautiful. 
Uh, and, but it was built by Herod, uh, which well, he wasn't a Jew, and which ticked the Sadducees off, because that was just not appropriate, that non-Jewish hands built this temple. And so what Herod, one of his son, grandson, Herod Agrippa, who wasn't a half-wit, he was pretty sharp, he was raised in Rome, Herod Agrippa, named after a Roman general. These Jews were not crazy. They named their kids after Roman generals because they wanted to suck up to the Romans. Uh, but Herod Agrippa built a palace right beside the temple. Right beside the temple. And they would perform, the priests would perform sacrifices in a courtyard outside. And so it must have been a mess. Because the priests were sacrificing animals like 24-7. I mean, it wasn't like once a week. They were doing it all the time. So it must have been a bloody mess. You know, with animals and people, cry, yeah, animals crying and it's just awful. Fly, it must have been awful. You know, but they, they did. And Herod Agrippa wanted his guests to enjoy, because they didn't have TV, you know, then, wanted his guests to have some dinner entertainment. Yeah. So he built his palace so that his dining room overlooked the courtyard in the temple where they performed sacrifices. So you could be chewing on a hunk of mutton and watching them sacrifice a, a goat, yeah, a sheep, down there. And you'd say, oh, oh, that's nice. Well, the fact that he did, and, and you know, because they didn't have cable. Uh, the, um, what what the, the Sadducees did, because they were really ticked off that this non-Jew, because the Herods couldn't go into the temple. They weren't allowed to go into the temple. Even though they built it, they weren't allowed in because the Sadducees ran the show. And they weren't Jews. They were not Jews. So they weren't allowed in the temple. And so this is as close as Herod Agrippa could get to the sacrifices. He could look at it from his, sort of from his balcony. Well, what the Sadducees didn't even want him doing that. And so they built a wall high enough that it would block his view. So now Herod's guests were looking at a wall. A wall. You know, we're looking at a wall. Because the Sadducees, because they, they wanted the righteous worship. Well, since it was worship, temple worship, what happens when the Romans tear the temple down in 71 after the big Jewish revolution? They don't have a job. They don't have a job. I mean, they don't have a job. And you can't like, well, I sacrificed at the temp temple. Well, I'll do it in uh, Nazareth. We'll start sacrificing. Can't do it. One place. Temple. On Temple Mount, Mount Zion. In Jerusalem. Once that's gone, Sadducees cease to exist. So the righteous ones are gone by the time the Gospels are written. You know, Mark, it's kind of on the edge. So they're gone. So that was one group. Disappears by the time most of the Gospels are written. What's another group within? Pharisees. Ah, Pharisees. Now, one, the Sadducees hated the Romans because the Romans, particularly Pilate, Pilate was a jerk. You know, Pilate was a real jerk. Uh, but because he wanted to put in statues in the temple. He, the, Herod was a, was a, he was a loser. Um, but the, um, they hated the Romans because the Romans interfered with Jewish worship. You know, and they did not, like, they wanted, they were for independence. So the Sadducees were giving religious, you know, backing to this revolution that the Romans shut down in 71. The Pharisees, on the other hand, Conspired. They were they were not they were not yeah they conspired with the Romans. They were not all that upset with Roman rule because the Pharisees instead of emphasizing Jewish worship there are three things the Jews could claim. Well actually if you include land but you can kind of do the law. King and the king is gone. You know David's gone. Mm -hmm. And Davidic kings are gone. You've got worship or land, the temple. Or you've got law. And while the Sadducees focused on worship, worship. worship and temple, the Pharisees focused on law. 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 And, and what they said is the law is what makes us Jewish. The Sadducees would say the temple worship makes us Jewish. The Pharisees would say the law makes us Jewish. The Zealots, another group, would say the Davidic king makes us Jewish. Mm -hmm. So you have these three groups, you know, by the Pharisee said, we want Jew, being Jewish means following the law. And so with the Romans, as long as you let us live in our little communities and let us follow the law, we are not going to cause you any problems at all. We're not going to cause you any problems at all. We really don't care 
about temple worship. We don't care because that's not what makes us Jewish. Following along. And the Romans, because the Romans were all about business, Romans would say to the Pharisees, are you going to pay your taxes? Are you going to pay your taxes? Yeah. And the Pharisees said, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. I don't see anything in the law that says you can't. Yeah, we'll pay our taxes. Romans said, yeah. you know, understand. One of the, I was telling my father this the other day, the Romans persecuted, because you do, you talk about, Romans persecuted Christians not because of who they worshipped. Romans did not persecute Christians because we worship Jesus Christ. They didn't pay their taxes. Well, even something you think is even, even less, because remember, in Luke, you got that story of the fish. You know, render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. What, you know, so Jesus is saying, pay your taxes, guys. Because Luke doesn't want in the gospel, you know, don't pay your taxes. That's stupid. You know, pay your taxes. So, and Paul says, pay your taxes in the 13th chapter of Romans. The Romans persecuted Christians because they were not patriotic. Because what the Romans would do is, and now we're drifting everywhere, way away from Peter. What the, Romans, what the Romans would do, what the Romans would do is Romans were, and, and I can't emphasize this too, Roman were they were about business. They were about money. In fact, I believe, I've talked to your husband a lot about this. He and I have talked to him. History is driven by money. History is driven by money. It is. It just is. Who has, who doesn't? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that drives history. You know, somewhere you scratch beneath the surface of money, there's a dollar sign or something underneath it. There's gold underneath it. It, it just drives history. Romans were about money. They were about spending it and collecting it. They don't want to spend it. They don't. They want to collect it. That's why they set up their empire the way they did. Well, one of the way, one of the things that's bad for business is when people get mad and they rebel. Because rebellion, like I said before, when you rebel, one, you don't pay your taxes, so you're not getting money in. And second. What do you have to do? Spend money. Yeah, you got to spend money to put the rebellion down. And the Romans don't want to do that. They don't want to spend money to put the rebellion down. That's one reason why in the Roman, you didn't have every territory in the Roman Empire didn't have Roman governors. The Romans had to pay the governors. They didn't want gov Roman governors. They only had governors in problem places. What the Romans did was they found themselves a king and made a little king. You know, because that means the king had to collect the garbage. You know, the king had to collect the garbage. He had to pay for the police. You know, the Romans, Roman territories, they had to pay for that stuff. You know, you put a client king, the client king does it. As long as he's getting taxes, we're getting taxes from the area, we don't have to spend much money. And they so, protected their tax collectors. Oh, we'll, we'll talk. Maybe when we talk about Matthew, we'll talk okay. about tax collectors. Because they were, they were a mess. Tax collectors were awful. Uh, in the Roman Empire, and the Romans wanted it that way. So the Romans, what the Romans were, they wanted money, and and problem areas were were areas in rebellion that didn't pay the taxes. And one of the ways Romans kept the empire together, and geez, it lasted a long time. The United States, we're talking about two hundred and fifty years. The Roman Empire lasted. 500, 600 years is a long time. They held it together because they didn't care about religion. They didn't care about religion. They would accept anything as a religion. If you said, I worship that chair, Romans would say, okay, we're good. We'll put that, go for it. We'll put that chair in the pantheon because the word pantheon means... Many gods. Yeah. Actually, it means even more dramatic. It means all gods. You know, so the pantheon is just... A, Add another altar, you know. They'd have put an altar to Jesus in the Pantheon like next Tuesday. That would have been easy. And part of being a Roman was accepting that this is your God and that's fine, but, you know, Patty has another God. You know, that's okay. That's okay with you, me, that you have another, you worship another God. You have another religion. And in fact, to emphasize that, the Romans would have community barbecues which is I kind of like, being a southerner. You know, you can't go wrong with barbecue. Have community barbecues. And, and what they would do is they would sacrifice, make sacrifices to all the gods. Every religion in the area sacrifice. You know, so it's an all day of sacrifice. 
You know, something you bring your kids to. Nothing like slaughtering animals on, a, on an altar, you know, for kids. So you bring, you bring all the animals, you sacrifice all the animals on the altars, and, um, uh, and then you have a great big barbecue, which is good because, the, the, you know, animals for sacrifices, they were the best. And so when they, when they cooked that meat and you all shared it, whew, that was pretty good stuff. You know, that was a problem Paul wrote about in, this, in the 14th chapter of Romans. You know, what do you do with, how can you handle sacrifice meat? Paul deals with it one way. Luke and Acts deals with it another way. But, but that's, that's a big issue. Well, the Romans, what Christians would say is, what Christians tended to say, or had a ha bad habit of saying is, well, we have no trouble paying taxes. We'll pay our taxes. We, 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 don't, want to, we don't want you to recognize us as the only religion. You don't... Don't put an altar for us in the pantheon. The Jews said the same thing. Don't put an altar for us in the pantheon. But Christians would say, we can't participate in the civic barbecue. We, we can't do that. Because that's sacrificing, those are sacrifices to gods we don't recognize. Now, Paul ends up saying, you know, guys, don't be stupid. <laughs> you know, they're, they're empty gods. They aren't gods at all. So look at it that way. It's good meat. The gods that they worship don't exist, so maybe it's not bad eating meat, sacrifices, sacrifice to gods that don't exist. You know, maybe you should back off a little bit. That's kind of what Paul says. But a lot of Christians said, no, we can't do that. Of course, Paul also says, if it bothers you, don't do it. And a lot of Christians said, boy, this really bothers me, so I'm not going to do it. And the Romans said, not part of us? You're not going to participate in a patriotic... We don't, we don't expect you to worship any other gods. We just want you to participate in this civic ceremony. You're not willing to do that? Christians say, nope, no. no. And the Romans say, oops, we got a problem. Because if this, this idea expands, and we all of a sudden have the followers of Mithra, the god Mithra, they start saying, well, we can't participate either. And the ISIS people say, well, we can't participate either. Now Romans have a problem. Because they have division. Because now you got divisions. And you talk about religious divisions, ooh, political divisions are nothing. When it's religious, boy, that you kill one another fighting for your God. Mm -hmm. You know, now the Romans have a problem that's bad for business. And so the Romans gotta squelch that that idea when it's in its infancy. You know, you gotta you gotta get rid of this now. Yesterday. And that's when that's when you start seeing limited persecution, you're going to see a lot of persecution in 200 years. You know, a lot. And Christians, Christians, sometimes Christians participate. The Christian church, because people were dying for Jesus Christ, if, if you look at somebody and, they, and you say, let's say George, George died because of his faith in Jesus Christ. He died for his faith in Jesus Christ. How do you feel about George? He's a good example. He yes. is a good example. My gosh, yes. what, an, what an example of faith. He died for Jesus Christ. And the church, because, you know, persecution, well, the church started saying, well, George, maybe George has a special place in heaven. More jewels in his crown. Because he died confessing Jesus Christ. Wow. What you ended up having, though, is you had some Christians that said, boy, that's great. My life stinks now. You know, maybe the afterlife will be better, particularly if I am a martyr. martyr. And so you had Christians seeking martyrdom. You know, which man, the easiest way to get, become a martyr is to go up to a Roman soldier and say, Nope. Yeah, I think you, yeah, I think you drink gutter water. All you, all you pagans are, 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 are lousy. You're all... Terrible. Communists, Nazis, I don't care. You're terrible. You know, I don't like you. I'm not going to obey your law. And the Roman soldier says, fine by me. Whoosh. And the person that has the sword is whistling in the air. The person is saying, yes, yes. You know, you had people seeking martyrdom. And, and, and in fact, in early church writings, you get early Christian writers saying, <laughs> now, remember that stuff we wrote 100 years before about martyrs? We've been rethinking some of this. You know, that maybe not all martyrs are the same. You know, some martyrs, if you're stupid and a martyr, 
you know, maybe you don't get a special place in heaven. In fact, if it looks like suicide, maybe you'll go to hell. And, you know, we, so we got to stop all these Christians that are seeking martyrdom. Be real careful when we judge, you know, Muslims who blow themselves up to go to heaven or kamikaze pilots that fly into ships. Be real careful. We as Christians were doing that in the early church, seeking martyrdom to bring glory to God, you know, that, which wasn't good at all. So anyway, um, but you're, you're right about, uh, but the Pharisees, they wanted to be in that little community. They wanted the Romans to leave them alone. They'll pay the tax, just leave us alone. And the Romans said, so you'll police yourself? Yeah, yeah. you police yourself? Yeah. You'll collect your own garbage? Yeah. You'll feed yourself? Yeah. You don't need any governor over you? No, we'll govern ourselves, but we'll be good, we'll obey Roman law. Roman mm -hmm. said, shake. Yeah. You know, shake. And so the Pharisees loved the Romans. Romans loved the Pharisees. Except when the fair, you know, Romans started intruding in, in Pharisees. But it was a it was a perfect relationship. And that's by the time the temple goes, Pharisees are the only ones left. The zealots are gone because the Romans shut them down first. Tear down the temple, the Sadducees are gone. You had another group called the Essenes, but they were living in monasteries. You don't worry about people living in monasteries, you know, because they want to be by themselves. So they're not an issue. The Pharisees, they just want to be left alone. And the Romans said, as long as you pay your taxes, go, go to it. You don't cause us trouble. We're happy. Go, go. We don't care. And, uh, and, and so the Pharisees, and that's why the Pharisees are the big enemies in the Gospels, because they're the only Jews left. So don't make the Pharisees, Sadducees a big enemy because they don't exist anymore. You know, but the Pharisees do. And that's why the scribes, and scribes are the ones who wrote. They were the experts in the law. They were the ones that made the copies, you know, of the law. So scribes and Pharisees, scribes, Pharisees needed scribes. Scribes needed Pharisees. You know, scribes needed people who thought the law was important. You couldn't earn a living working for the, for the uh, Sadducees because they, they, didn't they didn't care so much about the law. You know, so if you're a scribe, the only way you're going to get a paycheck is to find a Pharisee to work for. But a Pharisee needed a scribe to write down and interpret the law. I mean, so it was a symbiotic relationship, and that's why they're always together. It becomes really radical when you read the Gospels, and you end up seeing in the Gospels where the Pharisees and the chief priests, see, we don't see that because we don't, we don't look at it in that, those terms. But when we see, like in, in, the, in the third chapter of Mark, when the scribes and the Pharisees get together with the Sadducees and the Herodians, man, that's a big deal. Because that's like the Democrats and the Republicans saying, we got to get rid of this guy. You know, that's, that's a big deal because you got two groups that hated one another, hate with this guy more, enemy. had a common enemy, and it's him. And that's Mark is, I think that's the point Mark is making. They are united against him. The leaders are united against so, Peter. <laughs> I have one question about yeah. Peter. I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, it's okay. Um, we know that Peter was the only one, is that right, that was married? Yes, yeah, we got and, and the, where I, um, but it's, I can't find it anywhere in the Bible other than saying, you know, Jesus healed his mother. That's it. That's, That's the only it. place you're going to find. Okay. It. That is the only place you're going yeah, to find. Yeah, which is that Matthew 8, 14. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's the only place you're going to find. Yeah. It's because of the mother at all. Okay. Uh, I was just wondering. Yeah. Probably Paul probably was married too. Probably. Because whether his wife was living or not. Because that's just what you did. Mm -hmm. uh, in the ancient world, one of the things you needed were kids. Uh, you had to, because... In the ancient world, as many people were dying as being born. So for your society to survive, you had to have a lot of kids being born because most of them died before, you know, before sex. They yeah. they, before they had kids. Yeah, well, they died before they were economic contributors, which is another issue. But, for the, but you know, it was, and therefore anything, any, anything that um, didn't produce kids were, I mean, that was bad. That was bad on your society. You know, that's why you couldn't have celibate people. Celibate people were bad. <laughs> Homosexuals are bad in a society because they don't produce kids. You know, you had to produce kids. That's why a man could have as many wives as he could support, but a wife could only have one husband. 
Because a wife can only be pregnant by one man, but a man can have five wives pregnant at the same time, knowing that four of those kids are probably going to die in infancy. You know, and so it, it that's that's an economic that's an economic issue. You know, you had to have kids because the population was stable. I mean, it wasn't going up. It was it was hanging in, and you had as many, have to have as many people as possible come in. Now, nowadays, population is what like that. You know, it started to spike about 200 years ago when people started eating better. You know, do better, you, medicine. better medicine. People, we were talking about it at the beginning, living longer. Mm -hmm. You know, so population is spiking, ended up spiking. You know, so what do you do? You know, do you, do you apply the same things you did when the population was stable, when the population is spiking? You know, if God were writing to us now, would he say the exact same thing? I don't know, maybe. But he, I don't think he would be... I don't think the law would be so generous on polygamy with, for men. You know, get as many of your wives pregnant as possible. You know, I, I don't think God would say that now. You know, because we don't need that. That becomes a, a problem yeah. for us. You know, that's, that's, that's an issue. Uh, so, uh, you know, things, things change and how you deal with the law changes. But Paul was probably married because that's what Pharisees did because they were good Jews. And the only way to produce new Pharisees is for Pharisees to get married and have kids. But women died in childbirth. So, you know, he could have been married and his wife dead. Some of you have even suggested that when Paul wrote about his thorn in his flesh, <laughs> that was the old lady back home. <laughs> which, which, when he says, ask God to remove the thorn in his flesh, means something entirely different. <laughs> God approved of, uh, I always wondered why God approved of more than one wife. This is it. Did he, did he really? Well, one of the things that, that I think is really important for us to, I, I think it's important, now this is my opinion, and I'm giving you rudicurism. Um, I think we, when we deal with scripture, we deal with all, I think I deal with, and I would encourage, certainly I would encourage others to, all scripture is inspired by God, all of it. All scripture is cultural. It's written to people living in a culture, living in a time, at a time, to address people in that time. Christians have never believed, historically, that, that scripture is like the Quran. You know, the Quran was the word of God from an angel to Muhammad's ear and he took dictation. Christians have never viewed scripture like that. That's why we translate it into other languages. Muslims don't tra translate the Quran. You gotta learn Arabic to know what God wants you to do because God spoke in Arabic when he spoke to Muhammad. We don't believe that. That's why we translate it all over the place. So when we look at the law, is the law inspired? A absolutely. Was the law written to people who lived 3,000 years ago? Absolutely, because it was. I mean, the people who read it lived for 3,000 years ago. What is fascinating, and, and this is what I think is, is powerful in it, is the people who, so they're developing it to fit the civilization in which they were living. And therefore, we've got to be, sort of be aware of both. This is the word of God, therefore, we don't want to, I hear too many Christians saying, well, we're just not going to pay attention to this. We're just not paying attention. But boy, we're going to real pay, really pay attention to this. Oh, this is nothing. But this is really inspired. Boy, I think that's dangerous. I think that is really dangerous. Because who's making the decision? Human. Humans. I'm, yeah, human. I'm making the decision. But I'm going to say, I'm going to say when Paul says women should have their heads covered, no, oh, that's cultural, that's not inspired. But doesn't the Ten Commandments say you shall not do that? Do what? She, and, and the Ten Commandments is a law, and God made the law, so... Do, do what? A, 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 a polygamy? Adultery. Well, but, but they, wouldn't, they wouldn't define polygamy as adultery. That's multiple marriages. They would say, they would say a multiple marriages didn't <laughs> fall under adultery. But that's yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. that's, the way, yeah. that's the way they would have interpreted the law there. That adultery would be violating the promise that a man makes to, to his wife. I could have four wives and promise. commit adultery, but not necessarily. If I violate the promise I make to the four wives, then I've committed adultery. But Alice, what you've done is, is you've identified the problem when we when we focus on the law and take it out of its cultural environment. Because what happens, and, and you don't know, you may not know you did that, but you did. 
as soon as I do that, because you raised a great question, you know, having multiple wives, isn't that adultery? So what do I need to do with that commandment? Thou shalt not commit adultery. But my society needs multiple wives. Man, if every man has one wife, we are going to die as a society. We're not going to produce enough kids. We're just not going to produce enough kids. Because one, kids die before they reach the age of four, and too many wives are dying in childbirth. We're going to run out of wives. And we're not going to have kids, and our society is going to die. So we cannot do that to survive. God would not want us to die as a society. We are God's people. So we gotta have polygamy. But we got this commandment about adultery. So what do we have to do to the commandment about adultery? I gotta reinterpret it, right? And I gotta come up with a whole bunch of other laws to tell me when it's adultery and when it's not. Man, we do the same thing with killing. Thou shalt not kill. That's not rocket science. Well, if thou shalt not kill, what happens when the Babylonians are attacking us? Mm-hmm. Thou shalt not kill. What's going to happen to my society? You're going to die. I'm going to die. So, we can't do that. Well, thou shalt not kill. Well, what if somebody kills me? Or my, somebody in my society? What do I do to them? Thou shalt not kill. So what do I do to that commandment? I start interpreting it, right? And say, well, thou shalt not kill, but that doesn't apply in war. You know, when soldiers are fighting, that's really not killing. Why is that really not killing? Well, because I've determined that there are times when we do need to kill. Living in a fallen, sinful world. There are times when we're going to have to kill. So what I have to do is I have to create new laws. Underneath that. You know, and I don't want to call them loopholes, they're legitimate laws. The whole idea of indulgences, you know, which is a big thing in the Reformation. Indulgences were what allowed crusading knights to kill Muslims, to free the Middle East. Without indulgences, no knight would have fought, would have killed a Muslim. They would have gone to hell. So the Pope issues this saying is as long as you're killing a Muslim who's trying to kill you in the Holy Land, you'll go to heaven. Jeez, now I'm a knight. Now I can kill as many Muslims as I, as I want because the code gave me a get out of hell free card. So what we do is we create, we create laws to interpret laws. And that's what Paul says to the Galatians. Be really careful when you start doing that. Because he doesn't say it, but I'm saying it. Laws are like potato chips. You, you can't eat one. You know, once you start with laws, you got to keep creating. And, and they got to be more and more detailed because you, 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 the, the thou shalt not steal. Well, what if your family is starving and you, you take bread that doesn't belong to you? Well, what is stealing? You know, how do I know who's, you know, bread? Okay, let's, let's make a little law there that allows. We, we start interpreting the law. And that's why we end up with huge books of law that we need because we need to know where the lines are. The trouble is, you know, the Ten Commandments, the lines aren't clear enough. And so we, and that's why Paul says, be real careful as Christians not to reduce salvation in your relationship with God to law. Because then you're going to have to create a whole bunch of other laws to dictate that. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you so much for giving us the time together. Well, we didn't talk about Peter. Sorry, Lord. Uh, because that's kind of what we were called to do. Uh, but you were present with us. And... Uh, Maybe we can talk about Peter next week. Uh, But irregardless, you are still our Lord and you are still holding us in our hands, in your hands, and you're still guiding us towards the future. So help us feel your presence and your love. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Amen. I apologize to you ladies, you came to hear Peter and we we talked about all kinds of stuff. I still have a question. Where does it say a man can only have one wife? It never says that. Jesus says. Well, Jesus says, well, no, you're right. Jesus says a man will leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife. And, and uh, that's how... There, there can be... He, he can leave his... Uh, right, join to this right. one. You, and join to this you, one. It never says the wife can do that. You know, you know why? Because again, we're talking about culture. A culture. And, right. and Christianity is existing in a Roman world. And the Romans did not produce... Did not countenance allow polygamy. The Romans did. Now, the Romans allowed divorce. 
right and the left. It was easy to rule. But the Romans did not, were not, did not believe in polygamy. So the Romans did, not, Romans did not have multiple wives. That was sort of an Eastern thing. Um, so when the Christianity becomes more associated with Roman culture, it, it, it takes on characteristics, and it should. It, you know, it should. Because we are bearing witness to Jesus Christ in the United States of America right now in the 21st century. We are not bearing witness to Jesus Christ in the first century. If we follow first century standards in proclaiming Jesus Christ, we're not going to be heard because people aren't going to understand us. You know, they're not going to understand us. You know, we might be able to convert the world into the first century, but that's going to be really hard to do with cell phones. You know, it, 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 we're not going to be able to pull it off. We're going to do, do goofy things, you know. So we're not going to be able to do that. We're not going to be able to pull it off. And so how can the gospel of Jesus Christ, how can the Old Testament law, the Torah, how can we apply it in the world that we have? Well, that's kind of challenging. And it's not, I don't believe it's picking, well, this law applies, this one doesn't, this one doesn't, this one doesn't, this one does. This one does, this one doesn't, this one does. I, I, then I'm making the choice. You know, I, I'd rather deal with them all the same and that they all reflect God's word and God's will. How you apply it may be a little different. And we also, I think, need to remember that Jesus Christ was really clear on how we should be applying the Old Testament law. And Jesus, this was way back 2,000 years ago because Jesus said, all the law, the whole law and the prophets come down to two commands. Two commands. Love God, love, your neighbor. love God and love neighbor. And I'll tell you something, if you and if you're applying a law from the Old Testament or the New Testament, anywhere, if you're applying a law and it doesn't result in loving action, if the action is not doesn't reflect love, then the problem isn't with the law. The problem is with, with you. You know, you're misapplying it because every single one of those laws, including what to do when somebody, when an axe head comes loose and hits your neighbor in the head, you know, how you apply that law, which is very clear in the Old Testament, you know, what you're supposed to do. If you're applying that in a non-loving way, then it, you, it's your fault because the law was intended to reflect love, love for God, love for neighbor. And, and I think Christians, we... Our society won't do it. Can't. It, it, it. They really can't do it. And I understand. But as Christians, that's what we've got to think. Is this, is my application of the law loving or not? And if the answer is no, it's not loving. It's not loving. I'm getting them. I'm doing it to get them. Then that's my problem. It's not the problem. I can't use that law to hurt somebody. If I'm using a law in the Old Testament to hurt my neighbor, I'm, I'm using it wrong. I'm, I'm using it wrong. I'm misunderstanding it. And so I think that's, that becomes, to me, sort of the, the tin plate, the glasses mm -hmm. that we use to interpret law. But I think we've got to do, use those same glasses to interpret all the law. Ten Commandments, as well as that little bitty law about what to do when somebody hits, if you hit your neighbor with an axe accidentally. Mm -hmm. You know, all of the laws. How to sacrifice bulls, when to sacrifice a bull or a goat. I think you apply them all the same through that, those lenses. Is this, how, does this, how can this reflect love? And then you got a problem with what is love. Well, I, I think mm -hmm. a lot of multiple wives. That's right. Like that's this. right. Now, what what I would the problem I'd have, and if you got to go, 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 go. And if you want to stay, stay. I don't want to make anybody stay or go. You know, because it's yeah. Well, the, the the thing with the thing if we started saying if we and this is why I, why I mentioned it. And I think this is really this is really important that we better bear witness to the society, the world that we got, not the world that we want. You know, that's what we got to do. And if we, if, if Sligo Presbyterian Church says, we're going to, because nothing in the Bible says, and I agree, nothing in the Bible says definitively, you cannot have, a man cannot have multiple wives. Now, why a man would want multiple wives, I don't know. You know, one, one, I'll tell you, one wife is more, sometimes more than I can have. Uh, you know, and I could, and I certainly understand why, you know, because I know she wouldn't want any other yeah. man around. But, but you know, the, the, um, the reason I think it would be a really bad idea to say, well, then we can have multiple wives, is if we did that in our society, 
we we'd be out we'd be, be an outcast. Yes. Out we'd be ostracized. I'm going to say I went to Sligo last. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You go, I may have more than one wife. Yeah, you go ahead and say you know more. They think more than one wife is fine. You know, yeah. That's how rumors start. Yeah. Although that may get some people that we didn't expect. Uh, We're told to follow the law. They're out there land, as long okay. as they don't contradict God's law. And God doesn't say to have multiple wives. He just doesn't say, you know, he doesn't say that it's prohibited. So we have to follow the law that we're, we're living under. Is yeah. the law. And, and I, think, I think Paul, I, I, I love Paul. Paul is wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Paul is wonderful. One of the things, because, and when he's so down to earth, I mean, there's a lot of issues with Paul. I mean, he's, he's repetitive. And he's kind of boring, and he has long run-on sentences that go on forever, <laughs> ever. And he's a plotter. He answers rhetorical questions all the time, and you go, oh, you know. But one of the things that Paul says, and I think I think this reflects what he says, is you know when it comes to the law, don't be stupid. You know, just don't be stupid. You know, use a little common sense. You know, if if you are if if you're in a situation where women are covering their heads. Cover your stupid head. Don't make a bare head an issue. That's stupid. You know, if you're in a situation where people aren't eating meat offered to idols, don't eat. But if you're in a situation where people are, then either excuse yourself from the table, but don't make a big deal about it. Because you, what your, your focus has got to be on sharing the good news. And the good news is really simple. You know, that you are loved by the creator of the universe. And Jesus Christ died for you and set you free. And you were inspired by the Spirit. That's the good news. And if anything that gets in the way of somebody hearing that, if it's something as stupid as whether you eat a pork chop or not, you know, you, 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 you're missing the story. You're missing the plot, you know, here. And that's, I think that's what Paul says. You know, don't create laws. You know, just take the simplicity of the gospel and do the best you can. But don't judge other people in doing it. You know, don't create divisions where they don't. That's like when we went to high school on Friday, it was fish. 